Taste TV and the International Chocolate Salon present a virtual chocolate salon panel in conversation with three self-taught chocolatiers. We'll learn more about how they got started. We hope you discover and support these great artisans. A little about Taste TV. Taste TV is an international media company based in San Francisco and founded in 2005. Taste TV produces television programs, online videos, product reviews, award competitions, live tasting events, especially for chocolate and wine, and books. Several books have been published on chocolate, such as the Chocolatier's Primer, French Chocolate, and the official Chocolate Journal. Tasty Bee's live chocolate events are called chocolate salons and include a number of artisan chocolatiers, panelists, and experts who come together to enjoy great chocolate. First on our list is Seth Bain. Seth Bain is a self-taught chocolatier and founder of The Confectionist, where he creates small batch confections from his East Bay kitchen. Making artisan chocolates is a passion that unites his lifelong love of candy with a deep respect for craft and creativity honed during his many years as a professional in the design world. Seth Baines, The Confectionist. Next up is Karen Urbanic. Karen Urbanic began Flying Noir, her chocolate company, during the last recession when the art market tanked. Amateur truffles made and served at opening receptions were the impetus towards her new métier. Learning to be a fine chocolatier and to build her brand meant putting a divergent set of skills to work. From the outset, the plan focused on fine chocolate that featured art, approaching each box as a nuanced composition of visual, textural, and taste elements. Karen Urbanic and Flying Noir have won several chocolate salon awards over many years. Our third chocolatier is David Gamble of Sonoma Chocolatiers. Sonoma Chocolatiers is a small, family-run, artisanal chocolate company in Sonoma County, in the heart of California's wine country. David, the chief chocolatier, made chocolates for fun for over 20 years before making chocolates as a career. Before being a chocolatier, David worked in international environmental policy and conversation with his wife. They moved from D.C. to Sonoma to make chocolates. And our moderator today is Charlie Kale. Charlie Kale is a lifestyle broadcaster, podcaster, and Reiki master, whose sensitive palate has allowed her to be a Taste TV chocolate salon judge for over eight years. An experienced celebrity event host and radio broadcast personality, including on stations such as Coit, her passions are food and beverages, animals, and energy healing. Her show, Mind Body Pause, Holistic Living for You and Your Animals, is on Empower Radio, carried by Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and others. Hi! Welcome to Taste TV's International Chocolate Salon conversation with self-taught chocolatiers. Thank you so much for being here. And you just saw a little bit about our award-winning panel. This go-around happens to be all from the Bay Area. Seth Bain of The Confectionist, Karen Urbanic of Fly Noir, and David Gamble of Sonoma Chocolatiers. And we'll give you information on them and how you can connect with them and buy their chocolates because you're going to want to after you hear about the amazing way they make them and how they taught themselves to do it. And uh, David, Seth, Karen, I just have to tell you a little bit about, for me, I was brought up my entire life being told that if I'm going to eat chocolate, it better be good chocolate. So my mom was right on track. We had chocolates given to us for birthdays and Christmases, which is how we got our good chocolate and we'd portion it out. And Fast forward many decades later, I'm in San Francisco, my mom's in Virginia. She sends me this email that she was in church and for some reason, I don't know what the minister said, but it prompted her to stand up and declare, I raised two al alcoholics and I'm proud of it because I'm one too. The congregation was gasped and she said, chocoholics, I meant chocoholics. <laughs> so with that, <laughs> <laughs> That's a 
little bit about my chocolate loving history, let's find more about yours. First of all, uh, what is your why? What makes you do chocolate and be an amazing chocolatier? Karen, let's start with you. Karen from Fly Noir. I've always loved chocolate. Um, before I became a chocolatier, I carried um, a fine chocolate bar in my briefcase all the time. It was my emergency go-to to um, make me feel better after a really trying day. And it might sit there for a long time, but I knew it was there and that was important. I really appreciate how complex chocolate is. Um, the science of it is really interesting too. And right now we know more about it than we ever have, but there's still a lot more to discover. So I like that there, you, you never stop learning with chocolate. And, and now we have so many wonderful chocolates to taste from different origins around the world. So that's really important to me. <laughs> nice. Seth, what is your why? What fills your heart about <clears throat> You know, uh, like Karen and probably like most chocolatiers, I love chocolate and, and all kinds of different candy and confections. Um, I think the thing that really inspires me when I get into it is the craft um, and bringing, you know, I talk a lot about aligning my, my heart and my hands and my head and doing something that I love that's physical. It's a, I'm a maker at heart. So the idea of sitting down and creating something that is beautiful and delicious and giving it to family and friends and, and uh, it, chocolate brings joy to people. So I, I really found that um, it makes me happy to make it. It makes people happy to eat it. Um, and it, it soothes a part of me that I find that uh, doesn't get soothed in a kind of more traditional uh, office job that I've had in the past. So it, it's really something that's a nice way to bring my passions forward with, with, um, with what I like to do. And David, how about you? Well, before I made chocolate, I worked in international environmental policy. And I really liked that. It was, it was wonderful. But the impact of what I did, I will never live to see. With chocolate, which I've been making for over 30 years for fun, I get to make a piece of chocolate, hand it to somebody, and I watch them smile. I get to bring joy to people's lives every single day. And it's a blast. And I've always made things since I was a little kid. So I get to be the artist and I get to bring joy to people. Especially here, here. right now these days, we need that comfort. That's mm -hmm. for sure. So I want to know a little bit more of, of about your chocolate and then we'll jump into how you got into it and how you actually taught yourself to do it. So uh, Seth, tell me a little bit about your chocolate, what you're known for. Yeah. Um, you know, I started making bonbons, uh, which were uh, sort of the gateway drug for me. They're also, I think, one of the more complicated things to start with. So um, I made a lot of bad bonbons. Um, and I really <laughs> there got are no bad about, bonbons. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Good point. Yes, but are. I made a lot of ones that, that I needed to work on. Um, but I, I uh, recently I decided, you know what I really love? I love bonbons. Um, I loved toffee as a kid. I grew up, I loved all kinds of candy. I loved Heath bars, score bars. And I thought, what if I made a, tried to make a sort of a grown up version of that because it was something that I was passionate about um, that I loved. And so um, I started making toffee. I spent about six months working on uh, toffee recipes and tweaking them and different flavor profiles. Um, and uh, recently decided I was going to submit it in the Artisan Toffee Awards um, just to see how it might go. I know I've, I've tried every award winning toffee that you guys have given awards to um, in the past. And I was like, well, I'm just going to throw mine in there and, you know, maybe I'll learn something. Maybe I'll get an honorable mention. And I did really well. I actually got a gold medal. It was super exciting. Um, and so right now, like the, for me, um, toffee is kind of for, very forward in, in what I'm offering um, and what my customers are excited about. Nice. David, what are you known for? We're known uh, a lot for our soft caramels. We make a whole range of soft caramels that are uh, then melt in your mouth from melt in your mouth to you don't even need to wait for them to melt. Um, soft and very soft. Uh, our salted caramel is our most popular. Um, but I try to, we have a whole range of truffles as well. So I focused on truffles and caramels the whole time. I make one toffee, uh, some other things also. Uh, but mostly truffles and caramels, 
and we make sure that all of our chocolate, all of our ingredients are local and or organic. Um, I'd say that's nice. it. And artist extraordinaire, Karen, <laughs> what are you known for? Well, the, the art is a big part of it because um, I make visual compositions and, um, and, and the flavors and textures are all part of it too. But a lot of people buy the box as, as a gift um, because they like the beauty of it. And that's my gateway to get into people tasting it. Um, so it, it, that's what draws people in. I do make hand painted bars, big square four inch bars, and each one is original. I use natural colors um, in cocoa butter and mica have since the beginning. There was one company that was, um, that was putting out natural colors that you could use. And now there are several, as of this year, I've seen maybe four or five different ones and there will be more to come. So the whole field is exploding. And when I do transfers, um, I had to paint them myself because they weren't available in natural colors. And I don't think they are yet. Um, but people also like unusual flavors that I do. It's just kind of tweaking an idea of something and um, having people taste layers of nuances um, on the palate is what I like. I, I like subtlety, mystery, um, getting people to explore and just see what happens when they, when they taste something. So, and I do want to get into sourcing and organics and, and quality mm -hmm. and ethically sourcing and all that a little bit later. Um, you know what, let's just ask this and then we will dive into how you taught yourself. But what are some of your most fun, crazy combinations? Maybe some mm -hmm. that worked, some that didn't, some that you love and others didn't, some whatever. And Karen, let's start with you and then we'll get to everybody. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, Crazy combinations, gosh. Um, Fun combinations. Well, let's see. Um, I don't know. I use a lot of um, brandies, alcohol, um, and then I will add maybe herbs to it or something. Um, it just it just starts with an idea and just playing with that, putting ingredients in my mouth and and tasting it. So um, I guess the wildest ones are yet to come. I can't think of a particular one right now. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. It'll come to you. Mm. David, how about you? Well, we have a line of cheese truffles. Mm. Cheese and chocolate go together really well. So I decided to create a line of cheese truffles. So we have a sage blue cheese made with Point Reyes blue cheese. We have a Fiscalini bandaged cheddar uh, with white truffle. Uh, that's the, the truffle, you know, the mushroom truffle, white truffle. Uh, we have a, um, a rosemary goat cheese, which is probably our most, one of our most popular truffles overall. And we have one more, I can't think of it at the moment. Uh, oh, lemon thyme brie, made with cowgirl creamery, Mount Tam triple cream brie. And People always are taken aback when they look at those and say, really, rosemary goat cheese? Are you serious? <clears throat> and it remains one of our most popular for a reason. So I would say that the cheese, cheese truffles are the wackiest that we've done. We've had a few that didn't work out so well. I have not been able to figure out how to make a good, um, uh, a good truffle out of Pliny the Elder, the beer. <laughs> so bitter. <clears throat> I've tried for a long time. It's funny you would say about the goat cheese because I was just trying to convince a bread maker the other day to take his Mexican chocolate sourdough bread and add goat cheese to it. And he just said, crazy talk, crazy talk. Thank you for validating my taste palette. Yes. <laughs> Seth, how about you? Yeah, you know, I haven't started exploring the world of uh, cheese, um, David, in the chocolate. That sounds amazing and a little intimidating. 
Um, you know, the, the combinations, um, you know, I like what Karen said too. I spent a lot of time trying to balance um, two, sometimes three flavors, but it's like juggling a little bit to get it right. Like the more flavors you include, the, the more either difficult it gets or the third one kind of falls off. So um, I have a line of chocolate bars. I make dark chocolate bars. And I, what I really like doing is taking, I love nuts uh, and chocolate. I think it's a great combination. So I'm combining different nuts with a different sort of secondary flavor. Um, I did a bar uh, that was almonds with uh, orange zest, candied orange peel. Um, that was really good. It was actually something that I, I don't see a lot. And I think the flavors go great together. Um, my three most popular bars were probably that one. The other one I did was pecans and dried cherries. And then I do one that I really like. It's my favorite bar. It's pistachios and cardamom, um, which is another really interesting spice. I like working with uh, unusual spices. Some, uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the cardamom is fantastic. And I found like if I make a cardamom brittle by just taking, you know, caramelizing sugar, putting ground fresh cardamom pods in there, and uh, I make a, a sheet of that, crush it up into almost a powder of flakes and sprinkle that on top with pistachios of a chocolate bar. That's one of my best sellers. I really, and I enjoy that, that balancing of the flavors. Sounds amazing. So let's get into a little, little bit about how you were able to get into being a chocolatier and um, how you taught yourself to do this. And Seth, let's pick it up with you. Yeah. So, you know, my chocolate awakening, there are probably two chocolates I had that blew my mind. That's got me thinking about it. One was on a trip in France, uh, in Paris, there's a brand called Richard. Um, that's, uh, they make beautiful little tiny truffles and they're painted. They probably use transfer sheets, but they're very artistic. I'm sure Karen um, has seen them. Uh, and probably a lot of people are familiar with them. And I remember they come in a beautiful box. They were incredibly expensive and they were tiny. And I thought, this is really different than C's candy, which I grew up with as a kid. Um, and just being aware that there was a level of artistic expression and frankly sort of at the very high end of chocolate um, was something new to me and then years later when I came to San Francisco I wandered into the ferry building and stumbled upon Michael Ricucci's shop there. Um, mm -hmm. Michael has been a chocolate uh, inspiration and deity for me and my personal pantheon of chocolatiers um, is and I remember what it was it was the grapefruit tarragon chocolate that I had and I just thought, what a weird combination of grapefruit and tarragon. And he brought them together. And many, many of his chocolates have a similar balancing of unusual herbs uh, and fruits. And that kind of really opened up my expectation of what chocolates were. I still hadn't made chocolates at that point, but I felt like the world opened up for me a little bit. Um, and I love to bake and I love candy. And so I started to dabble a little bit. Uh, and, um, you know, it started with molded bonbons and kind of took off from there. But a lot of it was about this finding a way to personally express creativity and science because chocolate is really complicated and actually tempering is very mm -hmm. difficult. And there's a lot of, it's a really nice marriage for my brain of science and craft uh, with creativity and, and joy. And like David said, when you make one of these and you give it to somebody and they first they look at it, and they smile because hopefully it's beautiful. Uh, and then they taste it and, and smile because hopefully it's delicious. Like that's a wonderful. We seem to have lost Seth. I might have froze. Seth may have frozen. Okay. So I know he was saying it's a wonderful thing. So we'll pick it up from him when he comes back. Um, Karen, how about you? Um, I'm sorry. I got distracted. What was the question again? <laughs> right. <Sorry. laughs> I know. That's technology. That's for sure. Right. <laughs> these days. So, um, how did you get into it and how did you oh. teach yourself? Well, uh, for decades, I made, um, I made chocolate truffles and I would take a plate and pass them around, offer them to people at my art openings. And I always wanted to hear what, I thought it would be a great way to eavesdrop on what people were saying about my art, but they were never talking about my art. They were talking about where to go to dinner or whatever, but I became more and more interested in it. And so when the recession hit, I um, was trying to figure out what I could do to make money because the sales and commissions just evaporated overnight. And so I thought, oh, well, I can make chocolate. Everybody loves chocolate. You know, even, even if they have very little money, they can buy one or two pieces of chocolate. 
And so I was pretty naive about the whole thing. Um, I thought I knew how to make truffles and I learned pretty quickly that I knew nothing. So I really needed to study and um, I researched on the internet. I bought a few books and then I discovered the online course with Ecole Chocolat and I took the Chocolatier course and the, um, well, there's another one that is about um, basically shelf life and safety and all of those standards. And that was really helpful. I worked really hard, um, did all the assignments, um, just surpassed everything they asked for. And that really helped because I was used to learning as an artist, you, you know, you, you figure out how to do things. So it wasn't a foreign way for me to do it, to work on my own. And I probably have developed some bad habits that would be great to get rid of if I took a class, you know, at some point, um, if I have the funds, I'll do that. But um, working my way through it, just one um, recipe at a time and um, just seeing what happens. And when I make a mistake, figure out how to fix it and then having people try it. I once did a tasting with friends and made a huge mistake. I made them taste 17 different bars <laughs> in a row and they were just glazed <laughs> at the end of it, but it was a lot of fun. Anyway. Twist so. my arm. Twist my arm and invite me <laughs> to your tasting. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if anyone has not seen your chocolates, mm -hmm. they are just exquisite. The artwork is so beautiful and unique. Well, and that's different. what keeps me sane. And if I mean, we, I, yeah. <laughs> Sure, yeah. because I know at first I didn't want to eat them, but then I had to because mm -hmm. I was judging them. Yeah, so please. I had to know what it tasted like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, yeah, that um, at least you had the art down. You didn't have to worry about, you know, learning how to be an artist. So mm -hmm. that's for sure. Right. And everybody's right. art is their own unique expression. So it's not that you have to learn it per se anyway. But with chocolate, there are some specific things that you did have to mm -hmm. learn uh, about making it. So yeah, you did a lot of research for that. It's, it's, David. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, it's, it's a lot like working with encaustics, if you know what they are, where you're working with wax and resin and colors and it's molten like chocolate is. You have to work very quickly because it, um, it, so it, doesn't, it doesn't really dry, but it hardens very fast. So it's just like chocolate in that respect. So that was an interesting aspect. Nice. And David, what got you into it? How did you teach yourself? Well, I've been playing with chocolate since the 70s, <clears throat> just for fun. Like Karen, I would make truffles... Um, I'd make hundreds of truffles, especially at holidays, and just give them away. Mm -hmm. And I thought that I knew about making chocolates. And um, when I decided to change careers and become a chocolatier, my friends you know, all encouraged me and said, yeah, you make great chocolates. You should sell these things. And I rapidly learned that I didn't know anything about making <laughs> chocolate. Making chocolate professionally is nothing like making chocolate at home. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> totally different set of skills. Uh, takes a lot more attention to detail. Um, so I, I took the Eco Chocolat uh, course, the same as Karen, and then just started making truffles. I went around to stores trying to wholesale them. And that was less than successful because the truffles were not all that good. I did okay at farmer's markets, but... Um, the public is not quite as discerning as the buyers. So uh, I had to go back to the drawing board and just start making thousands of truffles to practice, selling them at farmer's markets, getting feedback and practice, practice, practice. Uh, it probably took me a couple of years before I would say I was really comfortable and mm -hmm. confident with my ability to make them. Uh, and given to friends, give them to family, get feedback, reading lots of books, reading online and practice, 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 and then more practice. That's how I got into chocolate. 
At you least know, it's add... to eat the mistakes. Yes. <laughs> Charlie, so, I want to add something too. I apologize. Yes, I dropped Seth, out don't worry, earlier. Seth. Uh, we're coming back to you. We're so happy you're back. So we ended with you. We didn't end, but we left off with you where you said it's a wonderful thing. So uh, pick up from um, some of your inspirations to where you, how you taught yourself to make it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and actually David's story reminds me a lot of, of the process that I went through as well, which was you know, I started making them at home as a hobby, as a gift for people. And of course, my family and my kids were like, these are amazing. They're so good. We love your chocolates. You should do this, you know. And, 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 and as I reached out and started making more people, I realized, wow, mine are really, in the beginning, were quite mediocre. Um, but the fact that you can, one can make a, a, a truffle or a bonbons, because I'm doing mostly molded bonbons, uh, in, um, it's, it, they're, very, they're very exciting for people. But actually taking it to that next level was a lot of work. Um, and I sell mostly at a farmer's market, a little bit online. Um, there's a couple of wine stores that, uh, uh, that also sell them. And I found the best feedback I got was from, not from family and friends, it was from people who were either in business. Um, there's a, a wonderful French chef named Alain at the farmer's market where I am. And I'd always bring him because he's a world-class patissier and he has his own uh, a wonderful bakery in Berkeley called La Noisette. And I'd bring him my chocolates. Like, what do you think of these? And he would taste them. And he would give me really, he's like, they're good. But this is wrong, you know? And, I, and, and that was super helpful, getting that kind of honest feedback from someone who is not um, in love with chocolate or your chocolates, but who, is, who understood the business. Um, there was an article in the New York Times several years ago about this chocolate camp or chocolate camp for pastry chefs um, in Las Vegas by this woman named Melissa Koppel, who is a famous mm. chocolatier and has an academy. And... I remember reading that thinking like, oh my God, that, that, that's even a thing I didn't know about. And so um, I thought about it and thought about it and saved and eventually uh, enrolled in her class. So that's the only professional class I've had um, is, is uh, Melissa Koppel's advanced bonbon technique, I think she called it. It was amazing. It blew my mind. Um, if anybody is interested in learning about bonbon making at the, basically at the highest level, uh, you can't go wrong. Um, and that's actually not what I do mostly in my business is I don't make Melissa Koppel worthy on bonds with the perfect shine and the incredible paint. And, um, you know, we're dealing with really different tools, first of all, like I don't have a temperature controlled spray room and I don't have a different temperature controlled room for tempering and I don't have four sell me chocolate temper machines. So I'm working mostly out of my home kitchen uh, and I've found ways to adapt what I've learned from her and on my own to the type of bonbons that I like and that my customers seem to like. Um, and uh, that process, that and the, and the book, uh, by Grueling. Um, I, I think it's called, I can't remember the actual title of the book, but it's the Bible, uh, in my opinion, of, of chocolate making. There's several great books. This is one of them. You know, reading that book, videos on YouTube, just making a lot of uh, good and a lot of mediocre bonbons and learning how to make a good one or even a great one, a trial and error is, is kind of what I've been doing for the last few years. So uh, just to reintroduce everybody for those just joining us, our panel is an award-winning panel, this time from the Bay Area, Seth Bain of The Confectionist, Karen Urbanic of Fly Noir, and David Gamble of Sonoma Chocolatiers. David, how important is sourcing of your ingredients, whether it's local sourcing, organic, natural, ethical, all the different things? Tell me a little bit about your journey with that. Well, my professional background before being a chocolatier was over 30 years of doing environmental policy, conservation, and alternative energy development. <clears throat> so when I decided to be a chocolatier, my first concern was finding ethically sourced chocolate. Um, I started with Scharfenberger because it was Rainforest Alliance certified. Rainforest Alliance is an NGO that I had supported as a, a professional environmentalist for decades. They um, help preserve rainforests around the world. And uh, I wanted something that was a little past organic, which is what Rainforest Alliance is about. And then I decided that, well, I didn't have to decide. It was just part of who I was. Uh, everything had to be the local or organic. And so all of our products, all of our ingredients have been preferably local and organic, but at least organic. Um, you can't go wrong hearkening back to the old cliche, quality in, quality out, garbage in, garbage out. 
if you use low quality ingredients, you're going to be like Sisyphus trying to push a boulder up the hill, uh, trying to make a, pro a quality product out of low quality ingredients. You got to start with the high quality ingredients and stick with them. So I have looked for in farmers markets and local markets for local people who I can buy herbs from. Um, some of them have come and gone. Uh, I've, but I've always stuck with um, local honey, local wines, local bourbon as, as much as possible. Obviously chocolate is not local in North America, <clears throat> but, and nor is the sugar, but pretty much everything else is local. I have to admit, I've not found a good organic rum or a good organic absinthe. I have made, found a local absinthe and a local bourbon. Uh, but other than the, the booze that I use, everything else is organic. And we're going to talk about booze and chocolate in just a little bit, but let's continue with this topic. Karen, what, how's your journey been with the sourcing? I started with an organic chocolate um, from, uh, gosh, they went away and now they're back again. Oh, I've forgotten the name of it. Um, and I bought, I think I bought uh, 400 pounds, which is one of the things that I really um, urge people to do is buy in volume if you can, and if you have a place to store it. But um, I used that supply from Ecuador for a long time. I'd made a decision that I would only use chocolates from the Americas. So as much as I love Madagascar, I don't use it in my, in my chocolate. Um, I have done a lot of work in Bolivia over the years in natural dye reintroduction um, projects. So I was very much interested in the Amazonian basin um, chocolates and I did go on a trip to Ecuador with um, the FCIA and tasted some wonderful chocolates there. So I, I've um, used those and also from the Dominican Republic. Um, oh, several different places. And I will feature chocolates um, like Amano. I will make bonbons with that or, um, oh, there's several different brands. Right now I'm using quite a bit of Falkland chocolate, which is very responsibly raised. And um, the chocolate that I enrobe with is a 68% um, Cru Sauvage. So it's a wild chocolate from Bolivia. So it's, um, so it's, it's, it's a chocolate where the um, pods are gathered on a yearly basis by a group of Chimane Indians and then processed by Falkland. So it's the trees are never touched. They're just these little islands of trees and um, they don't do anything to them. All they do is harvest them. So they truly are wild and it's an extraordinary chocolate. So I'm always looking for new chocolates. Um, all my other ingredients like David are local, as local as possible and, um, and organic. And I don't use glucose. Um, I use a little bit of honey uh, California honey and um, the colors I think do come from a lot of different places but um, the, everything has to be natural and um, no preservatives of any kind. Nice <laughs> thank you and Seth how about you? You know um, I, I totally am in agreement on uh, local and organic is fantastic. The other thing that I've thought a little bit about um, just because I'm a, a, a small family based chocolate company is working with family owned businesses. Um, so like for all of my butter and, and dairy I'll go to I use a local family run company called Strauss Creamery. Uh, mm -hmm. They're I'm sure you guys know them well because they're up in uh, your part of the woods as well. Uh, and and for my chocolate, mostly I, I play around with a couple different ones, but my go-to chocolate is from the Guitard Company, which is also a family-run business here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So um, it's as local and family-run as you can find, uh, you know, large market chocolate to be. Um, I looked into their uh, sourcing um, as well. They, uh, I, I'm pleased with like kind of the efforts that they go through in order to make sure that they're getting their chocolate from the best source um, that is ethically uh, and sustainably raised. Um, you know, chocolate is a, there's a, there's a lot of chocolate out there that is problematic, um, particularly at the, from the larger providers. So um, 
I found that that's the right balance for me. And I haven't kind of gone into some of the niche chocolates that it sounds like, Karen, you've explored as well. That, that's, uh, that would be interesting. Nice. And we may have lost that again, but that's okay. He's, yeah, he's back. Right, I'm back. Was I'm back. Okay, good. Was that everything? <clears throat> yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Um, so now let's booze it up. Let's get into um, alcohol, whether uh, you put it in your chocolate, as some of you do with different liquors and liqueurs, or even pairing chocolates, because we know they go so, with, so well with wine, with cocktails, with beer, with teas, with anything. But what are some of your favorites? Karen. I have a huge cabinet of alcohol that, um, that I use. And it's, uh, oh gosh, like grappa will brighten up um, a recipe with fruit in it. And um, so I have probably three grappas, all kinds of brandies, a couple of absinths, um, it, it, I use them extensively, and I think that that you have to take into account um, what the percentage is. I, I look for things that are over 40% um, because, or 80 proof, because you want as little water as possible for shelf life. Um, but they really are wonderful, and and people people's eyes sparkle when you say that there is whiskey or bourbon in in a bond bar. So that's always fun. Um, I'm always looking for new combinations. There's a there's a um, a seventy percent um, chinar, which is made from artichokes. So playing with bitters is fun, except that you have to be careful about the water content of them. So yeah, I, I use lots of alcohol. <laughs> good woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I eat lots of it, so that sounds good. Mm -hmm. David, how about you? You mentioned some earlier, so go ahead and talk some more and you can talk about pairing it as well. Oh, I'm pairing. Yeah, I oh, make a... you have some more pairing? We can come back to you, Karen, for pairings. Mm -hmm. I make a number of truffles and caramels with alcohol in them. One of our most popular is our bourbon chocolate pecan. We use Young and Yonder bourbon from up in Healdsburg. Uh, we also use their absinthe in our Earl Grey absinthe caramel. Those are in um, molded chocolates, molded shells, uh, very soft caramels. Uh, we, I've made truffles from wa local wines for a long time, well, from the very beginning. And those are very popular. Uh, as Karen said, the water in them makes the shelf life problematic. Uh, but if they're eaten quickly, it's not a problem. But we, you do have to reduce the wine to both get enough flavor um, and to drive off enough of the water to concentrate the flavor so you can decrease the amount of alcohol. Uh, using truffle, alcohol in truffles, you have to balance the, the, the cream and the alcohol uh, differently. I know, Karen, I don't believe you use much cream in your truffles. Um, but sometimes. It, sometimes. I'm doing more buttered truffles, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I do use it, cream sometimes. I use cream in, in our truffles and using alcohol with it as well is um, problematic if you don't watch the amount. Um, it, I don't rely on alcohol to increase the shelf life of our truffles because there's generally not enough alcohol in the truffle itself to um, contribute to the shelf life. Uh, but I look for all sorts of ways to use alcohols. Rum, uh, we, we, I have a new mojito truffle, uh, a Sazerac truffle. Um, I have a whole line of cocktail truffles. I don't actually pair chocolate with alcohol because I'm allergic to alcohol. So I can't taste the alcohol with the chocolate. <clears throat> so um, it's a bit of a problem in trying to figure out the, how to pair alcohol with chocolate, but putting the chocolate in the, in the alcohol in the chocolate, that's not a problem because there's not enough alpha alcohol to give me a problem. So you find you're not allergic to it when it's in your chocolate. Interesting. Well, especially, it doesn't take very long for um, some of the alcohol to evaporate out of the chocolate. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I don't have a problem eating the chocolate. I have a problem eating the raw ganache, uh, the straight ganache just after making it. 
I can't taste very much of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, eating the truffles, I don't like them because I don't like alcohol because I'm allergic to it. To it. Mm -hmm. So I taste it for the flavor. I don't eat too many of them myself. <clears throat> The flavors sound amazing. Okay, Seth, so start with um, alcohol that you put in your truffles, and then we'll finish with pairings, and then go back to Karen for pairings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, like, uh, like uh, David, I have a line of cocktail kind of based truffles, or a couple that I've done. Um, some have been really successful that I love. I love, uh, I do a mojito one where I'm kind of layering two different ganaches, a uh, white chocolate and uh, mint and uh, with lime, and then a dark chocolate with um, uh, bourbon. Um, uh, another one that I have done that uh, is really good is a mint julep um, that is good. The <laughs> worst one I've made, I tried to make a Negroni, uh, and maybe I just need to work on my uh, formulation for that a little bit. But the, the Negroni didn't come out quite as good. Um, but my favorite, I, uh, Karen, I liked what you said about if, if people, their eyes light up when they hear the words bourbon mixed in with chocolate. I see all the time. I, I saw at farmer's markets a lot, which is... By the way, advice for someone starting off uh, as a chocolatier, farmer's markets are great because you have to stand there, particularly if you're sampling, you have to sample and you get a lot of real-time feedback from people um, who are mm -hmm. standing three feet away from you or used to before COVID, um, who are tasting your chocolates and can tell you, you can tell where they like it, where they don't like it, which ones they like. Um, I didn't get that so much as when you sort of send them away and then you get feedback back from people. So I made a... Uh, a chocolate salami is one of my best sellers. It's uh, sort of based on a French thing called a saucisse sans sec de chocolat. It's, it basically is chocolate. Mm -hmm. There's no salami in it. I have to tell everybody that. It's sort of like a heavy, uh, a thick ganache with nuts. Um, and it's in the shape of a salami. And I roll it in powdered sugar. So it looks like a salami. Um, it's a lot of fun. I used to tie string on it, which was amazing, but it took too much effort. So it's hard to do that in quantity. But when I added bourbon to that and I would describe it to people, it's a chocolate salami with almonds and pistachios and pine nuts and crushed biscotti and a splash of bourbon. You would people say, ah, oh, you had me at the bourbon. Let's try that. So there, it's a, bourbon is one of those really wonderful flavors that seems to pair well with chocolate and it cuts across a lot of people's flavor palette they like. Okay. Awesome. Any favorite pairings? What? Karen, how about you? I'm not so much for me. <laughs> well, Let's one, throw thing it to Karen. <laughs> one thing I've learned is that if, you're, if your chocolates aren't so sweet, you can pair them with just about anything because my chocolates can be um, had with white wine and certainly um, sparkling wines, um, but all the way down. And, and as long as it's not too tannic, you know, just about any red wine. Pinot Noirs, of course, are really sort of universal with it. But also um, whiskey and um, cigars. Um, there was a barber shop that um, I had a little event there, and um, they were smoking cigars and drinking whiskey and eating my chocolate. And that was really fun. Um, so I don't... I produce boxes periodically that are oh, um, a spirit collection. And there is always something in the boxes that I have. One of the most popular ones right now is um, one with absinthe and Armagnac. And um, it's a butter ganache. And so there's a fair amount of, um, of alcohol in it. But I saw somebody um, making a comment and they said in some areas that alcohol can be a problem. It's a percentage wise thing. And you don't, I don't think you ever get there unless you just have, you know, one of those liquid alcohol bonbons. So um, I think you can use alcohol in lots of different ways. Beer pairings. I haven't done as much of that, but people have told me it works just fine. So I think um, the key to it is that I don't use, um, I don't add sugar. I, I might add honey or I might add um, a little bit of caramel that I make in a recipe. Um, but um, that seems to be the key for pairing. I, I can't I tell you how good I a stout is with chocolate, with a dark chocolate. Oh, so good. <laughs> and Zinfandel's tend to go really well with the darker chocolates and then the lighter and sweeter I like with uh, Chardonnay's, Sauvignon Blancs, 
champagne, a sparkling goes so well. Really, I have worked with a lot of wineries. A chocolate for yes. I've I've worked with a lot of wineries. I beg your pardon. I've worked with yes. a lot of wineries to do chocolate and wine pairings, and um, yeah, you're right. Chocolate goes well with especially just about any red wine. Mm-hmm. You can find some chocolate to go with it. Uh, some wineries like just straight chocolate with their wine. Some wineries are say that you can't pair chocolate and wine together. It's just anathema to their being. Mm-hmm. Um, others uh, are more exotic and look for unusual pairings. Uh, there is a, a, we use our, our chai nibbles, so, uh, little solid pieces of chocolate with chai spices in them to pair with a Malbec or a real spicy Syrah. Uh, the spices in the chai bring out the spiciness of the wine. I like to pair um, our little salted chocolate nibbles Mm -hmm. with uh, a port. It goes very well with port. It also goes very well with, um, what was that um, Malbec that they made? Um, And I really like pairing 80% cacao with... um, white wines with Chardonnay. It mm-hmm. goes, it, a lot of people like it quite a lot because it tends to bring out the fruitiness of the Chardonnay. Um, some people don't enjoy it, but most people that I've tried that with have found it um, surprisingly pleasant. That's perfect. It does yeah. sound wonderful. Explore, explore. It's just, Try like whatever you said from the beginning, you can't go wrong. You can't make a mistake because it's, it's a fun taste testing. And then you find out what you like. Some pairings are going to work better than others, but mm-hmm. nobody has turned, has tried a dark chocolate with wine and found it disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> it never goes there. <laughs> right. So yes. what are some new trends you're seeing in chocolate right now? Seth? Um, yeah, I, I see actually, you know what I see a lot of lately, or I see some places is, um, Ruby chocolate, which is a new mm. type of chocolate. Um, I am not a huge fan. I've tried it. I've tried working with it a little bit. Um, I generally have a bias. I will admit I'm biased towards dark chocolates. I sort of like the, you know, 64 and up range. I'll occasionally work with a milk chocolate and a ganache, but, um, I like the dark chocolate, so uh, I don't do a lot with white chocolate. Maybe sometimes it's the base for a for a ganache, um, but it's so sweet. And it, in my opinion, it it there's a character that I really like with the the darker chocolates that I don't get in white chocolate. So ruby for me. Um, for those, I assume most people listening are, are may know of it, may not. It's it's not white chocolate dyed dusty pink, which is what I first thought when I saw it. It's actually a a, a a formulation that is a naturally, it's a, it's a different kind of, I think, I don't know if it's a different kind of uh, cacao pot or whether it's a different fermentation process, but it comes out um, mm-hmm. as a sort of a dusty red color. Um, and to me, the flavor profile is closer to a white chocolate. It's got some other interesting volatiles going, but I don't like working with it because to me, it's got such a distinctive taste that doesn't really pair well with the other things I'm trying to do. So I will skip the whole Ruby trend right now, which seems to be a lot of people are experimenting with. Erin. Um, you know, I haven't tried the Ruby and the Yuzu and those. I would like to. It would be fun, but they sound like they're probably not ones I'd be super interested in. Um, I'm seeing darker milk chocolates, and I use a 49% dark milk chocolate, which is really popular because it satisfies Um, that craving for creaminess you know a lot of people start out with milk chocolate and and they have to kind of ease into the darker chocolates at at higher percentages but a dark milk um, works really beautifully in a box where you have an assortment so you have darker chocolates and then um, and then the dark milk and maybe one or two of white chocolate but transform so it doesn't taste like straight white chocolate because it has alcohol or spices or herbs or, or whatever. Um, I see more pralines 
you know, where you um, caramelize something and, and um, I use it and, and then grind it up and put it in your chocolate. It works well in a butter ganache. It, um, you know, just kind of gets absorbed into a cream ganache. Um, I think one of the trends that's, I can't believe how much color there is out there that's so much color. And I worry about people increasing um, synthetic colors in, in their diets. Um, there's some real warnings out there about how, how colors being added to everything that even if something is normally pink, you add color to hype it up. And, and that's not a good trend. Um, yeah. I would so, second uh, that. Part, yeah. I would second that. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So, David, trends. Um, one of the biggest trends I see is what Karen was just talking about: um, a lot of color on chocolates. Mm -hmm. And I don't do it. I just I won't do it. I won't put a lot of color on our cho on most of our chocolates. I use some transfer sheets. Um, mm -hmm. We use a bit of metallic uh, luster dust. Uh, using the mica, uh, but unless it's a natural color, um, I uh, try to avoid it. I like, and I, our tagline is taste the dark side. We're all dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. That's all we do. Mm -hmm. I've tried the Uzu chocolates. Uh, Valrona has a really interesting Uzu chocolate. Well, they call it chocolate. It's a mm -hmm. white chocolate with Uzu. Uh, it's, it's an interesting flavor. It's not for my palate. I'm not all that interested in getting into Uzu, uh, but the trends that the trend that I see is the same trend that started with um, was there when I started, which is more and more popular dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. uh, dark chocolate seems to be growing as a market share. Mm -hmm. More and more people are telling me, "Oh, I used to really like milk chocolate, but now I only do dark chocolate." And we've converted a lot of people from milk chocolate to dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. So that one is not a problem for me, sticking with milk with dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. uh, the other trends of, the other trend that I like is single origin chocolates. Mm -hmm. And that is a lot of fun to play with. Uh, getting different, the different flavor profiles of chocolate from, from different origins. Uh, I'm with Karen, I tend to stick to chocolates from the Americas. Mm -hmm. That's where it's from. I like going as close to the source as possible. So other than single origin, and, and right now we, we get some single origin chocolates from Picari, one from Valrona. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love a mono chocolate. It's a fabulous chocolate. There are some mm -hmm. other really good uh, bean to bar makers out there. One thing that I've done in our shop is uh, expand the bean to bar selection. I'm not a chocolate maker. I'm a chocolatier. So I've brought in uh, bars from some of the finest bean to bar makers that I can find just to make sure that I'm representing the world of chocolate for my customers. I'm, I used to carry only things that we made, but realized that the, that the market has changed so much since over the last 12 years to include more artisanal makers and bean to bar makers. And so I decided to expand into that as well. Yeah, David, I've definitely noticed that as well. The <clears throat> bean to bar uh, world has just exploded. I, I went to a conference in San Francisco last year that was you know, bean to bar chocolate and there were close to a hundred uh, different small <clears throat> you know, pur 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 purveyors of small mm -hmm. craft bean to bar chocolate bars, which was amazing and kind of also boggled the mind. It's a little bit like walking down the craft beer aisle in a, in, at Berkeley Bowl, um, which is there's just an unimaginable number of small individual craftspeople who are making bean to bar chocolate right now, which is not something that I do or uh, need to do. Um, Cause like you, David, I'm a chocolatier, not a chocolate maker, um, yeah. but I have a lot of uh, respect for the, those people who are out there creating unique chocolate bars. Yeah, there are two bean to bar makers within 10 miles of where I am. And they're, they're just prolific. We live in the golden age yes, of artisan chocolate. <laughs> there's, there's also um, a really interesting project called the Heirloom Cacao Project. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it's, it's kind of an offshoot of the Fine Chocolate Industry Association. But they're actually going out and identifying chocolate and, and um, working to um, look into the DNA of it and actually propagate those trees so that they don't disappear. So that, um, you know, there's so much that the, I mean, a single origin um, criollo may be um, endangered because they're going to take those trees out and put in something that isn't as vulnerable to disease or whatever. Um, but the, the heirloom cacao project accepts um, entries and they have um, a contest and then there's a tasting panel, an international panel that then um, will make, sometimes make little tastings available. And some of those are amazing. There was one that you could swear had balsamic vinegar in it, um, but it was just part of the profile of that particular chocolate. So those nuances are just fabulous. I mean, we're so lucky that we, um, that we have all of this available now to us. I was part of the panel for the Fine Chocolate Industry Association that uh, created the first um, protocols for the uh -huh. heirloom cacao project. Right. And I encourage anybody who's listening to check out mm -hmm. the heirloom cacao project. Mm -hmm. It is an important part. If you're a serious chocolatier or chocolate maker, uh, I really encourage you to support the heirloom cacao project. Uh -huh. uh, they're trying to preserve fine chocolate and it's, it's the DNA is part mm -hmm. of the definition of it. And then they, the sampling that Karen mentioned, they send, uh, they roast it under a specific protocol, send mm -hmm. it out to some uh, professional tasters around the world. And if they agree that it's a fine chocolate, it is then designated as an heirloom cacao. So it's not just mm -hmm. the DNA, it's also the mm -hmm. flavor profile mm -hmm. that's controlled as much as possible. So it's just the, the bean variety that is giving the, is defining the flavor, not mm -hmm. necessarily um, how it's fermented or how it's roasted because it's all done as a standard. I really recommend you all check it out. Heirloom Cacao Project. Nice. And so we can just Google that and, and find mm -hmm. it. You'll yep. find Heirloom and Cacao you can get a link Project. Or a link from the Fine Chocolate Industry Association. Right. Mm -hmm. It was started by the FCIA. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So and join the FCIA too. Absolutely. Join, join the Fine Chocolate Industry Association. They're really active right now about um, education and getting people together. Um, so it, it, there's a lot of service to the members that has just come on in, in the last few months, the last year, perhaps. Um, That's because the fog is our air conditioning. So. so our hour is actually up, but if it's okay with you panelists, can we keep you a little longer until they kick sure. us off? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> because sure. you're giving us such wonderful, valuable information, which we sincerely appreciate. So let's keep with that trend. What else would you suggest an aspiring chocolatier to learn, join, look into, research? Well, there are um, online journals that you can subscribe to and you can get daily offerings. Um, there's Food Navigator, um, oh gosh, um, I don't remember all of them, I subscribe to them, and some of them, you can choose which ones you want, whether you want Europe and the United States or other parts of the world, and then there are articles um, that are really interesting, you can skip a lot of it, but um, it really does show you what the trends are, what... Um, what some of the um, rules that are there in different countries that are problematic or what the public wants. So anyway. <laughs> nice, thank you, Karen. Um, David, you were mentioning some, but do you have any others that you thought of that people should look into? Explore the internet. There are so many out there. Check out Eco Chocolat. They have some great mm. classes. They have some great mm -hmm. ways to get information and hands-on. Valrona has classes around the country at different times of the year. Obviously, classes right now are not going to happen in person, but check them out over, over time. 
uh, and just explore the internet. And th there's so much information out there. Mm -hmm. And go taste chocolate. Go taste chocolate. I can't say it often enough. Taste the chocolate so you know the kinds of chocolates you like, what your palate responds to, so that you know you're not going to make a good tasting chocolate if you don't like it. So mm -hmm. make sure that you know what you like and you know what's available out there. And if you're thinking of starting a business, uh, make sure you do your homework. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seth, what do you recommend? Yeah, um, you know, I agree with David that there's a, so much good content out on the internet that you can just find. One of the resources that was really helpful to me and continues to be helpful, particularly that I'm a, I, I'm, real, I'm a little newer to uh, Chocolate Life um, than Karen and, and David are. I've only been doing it for a couple of years. And early on, I found a, a forum, uh, and I think it's based in Canada, called eGullet. Um, mm -hmm. which uh, there yes. may be hundreds out there like it, but they, first of all, there's a lot of chocolatiers in Canada. Like the Canadian chocolate scene is really vibrant. And mm -hmm. this is just a website of people who are passionate about, um, well, the e I think covers a wide range of uh, cooking, but there's a, a forum for, for chocolatiers. And I've gone on there a lot saying, you know, when I was learning how to temper, and I thought, you know, I'm having problem tempering. What's going on? I'm following these and people are like, show me a picture and I'd post a picture. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, oh, is it more than 70 degrees where you are right now? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, well, you can't, you know, do t slab tempering on marble if it's warmer than 70 degrees. Like, I didn't know. So, like, practical advice, um, finding, and you can find that online. You don't have to, um, I have paid for a couple of fancy classes and they've been dynamite, but there's a lot of free expertise out there and really helpful people um, that I, and, and friends I've made, though I've never met them um, in person, who have been uh, really helpful to me over the years. So, um, that's been a great resource. So there was a question about ideal temperature for making chocolate. Mm -hmm. uh, We're not chocolate makers. <laughs> <laughs> making chocolates. Okay. That's true. Um, what about ideal temperatures for storing chocolate? How, the, one of the questions from um, one of our guests is about uh, shelf life, longevity. What do you recommend? Mm -hmm. So I don't oh, do any, <laughs> anyone I don't can do, jump in, Karen. <laughs> um, well, with shelf life, as as we've spoken about, um, the AW the the um, available water is um, right. is always what you want to look at, and that right. will um, determine shelf life. But you do need to have storage that is cool enough and stable right. enough. Um, if you might always have a cover on your sheet pan rack, if you have one. I mean, I, I use sheet pan racks for storing all kinds of things, bands for my boxes and um, as well as chocolates, but I always make sure everything is covered. Um, I actually have these covers that fit on my trays and they're pretty inexpensive to buy. So it's, it's a raised cover and um, it, it really creates a protected environment. But your overall temperature should, it should be under 70 degrees for working and then cooler than that um, for storing. David, what do you store? What do you do? Um, our chocolate kitchen is kept at 67 degrees. Uh -huh. And Seth, I understand trying to table some chocolate at above 70 degrees is just not going to happen. <clears throat> um, so. I don't bother tabling anymore. I always um, temper chocolate. If I have to temper a small batch by hand, like a, maybe a flavored uh, batch that I don't want to use my temper for, uh, I use, I seed it and mm -hmm. just stir the heck out of it. And I use a microwave to, mm -hmm. to okay. yeah. control the temperature. Mm -hmm. And to store, uh, okay, everybody listening, you can store chocolate, you can freeze chocolate, you can freeze truffles. Let me dispel mm -hmm. the myth. You, can't, you can freeze truffles. However, you have to do it in a very specific manner. You can't cut corners. The way you do it is you put your truffles into an airtight container, and then you put that into a Ziploc bag, and you put that in the refrigerator for 24 hours. After 24 hours, you put it in the freezer. 48 hours before you want it, you pull it out and put it in the refrigerator okay. in the bag. And in the morning or at least 
12 hours later, preferably 24 hours later, you pull it out and leave it on the countertop for at least eight hours. Then you can open the bag. If you try to take shortcuts there, you're gonna have condensation on your truffle. But you can store chocolates in the refrigerator or the freezer. You have to be extremely careful how you do it. You don't wanna shock the chocolate um, and expose it from one temperature to another very quickly on the surface of the chocolate because water will condense. The chocolate itself doesn't care if it's uh, what temperature it is. It's the condensation on the surface that you're worried about. Mm -hmm. So we cold store all of our chocolates. Our truffles, I don't put any preservative in our truffle. I keep the, the sugar to an absolute minimum. I don't add any sugar to the ganache. I don't add any mm -hmm. sweetener at all to the ganache in any way. And I use cream. So there is a high water content because of the cream. And so I have to cold store our chocolates or they will just spoil rapidly. Uh, last week or two weeks ago, I left a ganache unattended for a couple of days. Some things happened with my family. I couldn't get back to it. And within three days, it was a ball of mold. So you have to manage the shelf life or watch it carefully. Mm -hmm. You can manage it with temperature. Traditionally, it's managed with sugar. And frankly, I don't like eating sugar pills. I like eating mm -hmm. chocolate. So that's what I do is, is cold store everything. Caramels will keep at room temperature. Toffee, you have to worry about uh, exposing it to the air because of humidity. Toffee will suck up hum moisture like a sponge. Mm -hmm. um, but if you control, just keep air away from the chocolates. Keep air away. And like uh, Karen said, if you put chocolate in a, a container, even at room temperature, it will create its own environment. The chocolate volatilizes, it turns into a gas. And the air within that container will have sufficient, will be changed sufficiently from room atmosphere to chocolate atmosphere that it expands, it enhances the shelf life a bit. Uh, it's not a panacea, but it does help. Anything you'd like to add to that, Seth? Um, I, well, I did learn about uh, storing toffee the hard way, um, about keeping air and humidity <laughs> away from it. So, uh, David, where were you six months ago? I could have used that advice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, when you were when I was giving to friends or selling at a farmers market, I wasn't that focused on shelf life. And when I first started um, selling, you know, to retail places, that's when I realized I had an up my shelf life game. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people don't want to risk chocolates that they have to keep in the fridge or the freezer. So they're like, give me chocolates, I'll put them on my counter. Uh, they got to last like a month. And a month is a long time. I actually feel like when I tell people, you know, a bonbon is best eaten the the uh, three or four days after it's made but like first week it's great the second week it's uh, good and then the third or fourth week uh, you know that's you go go to see if you uh if, if you want to buy old old chocolate mm -hmm. now that's not necessarily true because i think great chocolates um and and i aspire to make them um you know should have if you're going to sell them you know four maybe six week shelf life but they're really best done fresh um mm -hmm. i i do use sugar in my ganaches and i found uh, a couple of tricks which is like actually mixing a couple of different kinds of sugar as opposed to because sugars have different sweetnesses. So I'm learning a little bit about the chemistry of, um, you know, you can actually dial back the sugar and then play with invert or glucose or even sorbitol, which sounds like a dirty word. I actually don't like using sorbitol because I find it has a flavor, but a little bit of sorbitol, which is turns out is a natural sugar. It just has a name. It sounds like a chemical. Um, by combining sugars and adding them, you can actually soak up available water, which is what makes ganaches turn. So playing around with that, um, can help with shelf life. Mm -hmm. Yes, can. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. So as we wrap this up, I want to come back to each of you and just express one last thing you'd like to leave everyone with about chocolate, about your chocolate, about anything to do with the process. So Seth mm -hmm. Bain of the Confectionist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I if, uh, thank you. So Love being on this panel. Thank you very much. The one piece of advice <laughs> I would have for anybody who's trying to do this is make stuff that you love. Make chocolates that you love, that you're mm -hmm. excited about, that make you happy, um, because those are probably going to be the most authentic coming from you. And, and, and for me, at least, that's been my most successful chocolates. Uh, you know, I was really, I mentioned I was really inspired by the super shiny bonbons that you see on Instagram. And I took that class by the amazing Melissa Koppel, who makes, I think, some of the most gorgeous chocolates mm -hmm. in the world. Yes. 
they're incredibly shiny. They're like mirror finished. Each one is a work of modern art. Um, and I was like, that's what I have to do. And I, and I couldn't do it because A, it's difficult, requires a lot of expertise. It requires some very expensive machinery that I didn't have. I was working in my home kitchen. Um, and I began to realize, you know what? I'm going to make stuff that I love. I started making toffee. My toffee turns out is really good and I love it. My customers love it. Um, you know, I'm doing some caramels, some soft caramels. I'm, I'm experimenting with things that I love. And that I think has helped me make, uh, be more authentic with what I do. And I think people can taste and appreciate that authenticity. So make stuff you love. And what's your website? Um, uh, my website is, my business is The Confectionist. So it's theconfection.ist is my website. And uh, I sell stuff online. Uh, I happen to be on vacation at the moment, which is why you see this lovely uh, virtual background. <laughs> um, so, but uh, there's stuff in the shop and I will be fulfilling orders when I get back in a few days. No, the confectionist dot is. It's actually the confection dot is. The confection dot is. Okay, That's me. the confection dot is. Oh. Got it. All right, David Gamble of Sonoma Chocolatiers. Your last I, would, bit of I would second what Seth says, stick with what you like and make mistakes. If you're trying something new, you're going to make mm -hmm. a mistake. If you're not making mistakes, you're getting stale. Make mistakes. And remember, it's just chocolate. Have fun. It's not the end of the world. If you screw it up, melt the chocolate down and start over or throw it out and start over. It doesn't matter. It's just chocolate. It's delightful. It's delicious. You're going to make people happy. Have fun. And your website and where you sell your chocolate. Sonoma Chocolate, Sonoma Chocolate Tears with an S dot com. We sell it online and in our shop in Sebastopol up in Sonoma County. All right. And it's Sonoma in some of the Chocolate stores up here in, Seba wow. in Sonoma County also. And Karen Urbanic of Flying Noir. <laughs> um, you know, I made uh, some notes about um, what I might advise someone who's starting a chocolate business. I mean, use the, use the best chocolate that you can because you can taste the difference. And increasingly, the public really is becoming educated and, and knows the difference. And there are so many people to compete with. Um, I decided early on that I had to use the best ingredients and the highest art I could um, because I couldn't compete in terms of volume. So it needed to be on a different plane. So if you are starting a business, this is what I was thinking. Spend a lot of time soul searching about what is important to you. Who do you want to compete with? How big do you want your business to be? Retail, wholesale, or both? A shop or online? Enter competitions to get your name out there and build a reputation. Um, like the chocolate salons, um, that's a really good way to, um, to begin getting your, um, your brand out there. Set lofty goals and persevere. Listen to others, but stand up for what you know is right for you. Consider used equipment. Don't buy too many molds. If you can, choose ones with more cavities. They're more efficient, more compact. Buy in bulk when you can, if you have the storage room. And just stay open and, and be flexible, but, um, but just stay true to, to the chocolate and what you're tasting and have the confidence to go forward with your own ideas. Don't let people pull you or, or you know, pers persuade you that your ideas are wrong. If you feel strongly about it, then you should follow through with it and, and just hold your vision. Make your dream work. And your website and where we can find your chocolates. Okay. Um, flyingnoir.net. And I sell online and at events. Um, I have a following all over the country. I don't ship out of the country. It's just too complicated. And I use priority mail um, and have a particular way for shipping chocolate that is a box within a box. Um, ice packs and, um, and added um, eco peanuts, and then taping the seams of the box um, so that it really creates a, an enclosed environment. And I've had pretty good success with shipping it all over the country um, so that even if it's a three-day 
um, recipient, then it, it, it arrives and the chocolate is okay. Thank you all so much for sharing your vast amount of knowledge and mistakes, which is wisdom. <laughs> we appreciate it so much. I'm Charlie Kale for Taste TV and the International Chocolate Salon. And thank you all for being here. And now go out and eat some chocolate. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks thank for all you, thank you. listeners. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Nice to hook up with you again, Karen. Yes, you too. <laughs> Take care. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you, Seth. Yeah, you yes. too, guys. Bye. We'll, we'll have to get together, Seth. <laughs> Let's do it. I would love that. Yeah.